so we're going to start the current affairs uh, some of the important topics uh, for today and yesterday would be the finance minister calls for a debate a proper debate on gst reforms now it's important to understand what gst is gst is a type of indirect tax okay now what is the difference between direct taxes and indirect taxes okay some of the examples of direct taxes are income tax corporate tax while some of the examples of indirect taxes are gst customs duty okay now the biggest difference between direct taxes and indirect taxes is that direct taxes are always paid by the people who it is levied upon say for example you are a say for example you are a employee and you are getting a paid salary now on the salary when you pay your income tax then it is known as a direct tax however when you are buying a product in the market which has a gst that has to be levied upon your gst is not actually paid by you but rather the gst is paid by the shopkeeper now but despite the shopkeeper paying the gst what he does is that he adds the gst cost to the final cost that you are paying hence it is a indirect tax now what are the advantages and disadvantages of direct and indirect taxes this is what you will have to read okay now in the meanwhile the finance minister calls for a debate on gst reforms the roll back of goods and services tax uh, rate corrections on textiles in late december will hurt the production linked incentive scheme for the sector the union finance minister said now what was the roll back of these corrections what were the corrections that were made in december the corrections that were made in december was that the gst council it had actually decided to postpone the hike in tax rates on textiles so earlier it was decided that the gst rate on textiles would be made 12% from the existing 5% however the finance minister after coming under pressure from states decided to postpone this 12% to a later date and continue with the existing 5% the finance minister wanted to make it 12% because she wanted to make corrections in the inverted duty structure now what is inverted duty structure inverted duty structure means when you are paying a higher rate of tax higher rate of tax on raw material rather than on finished goods then finished goods now what is the problem in this the problem in this that if there is a higher rate of tax on raw material rather than on finished goods what will people import they'll rather import the finished goods why because there exists a higher tax rate on the raw material and hence it becomes unviable to import the raw material and then make the finished goods so this is what the finance minister had hoped to correct however because of coming under pressure from states who feared that increasing the interest rates on raw material would result in job losses for native users the finance ministry had to delay the imposition of gst rates it is believed that the tax rate will correct the inverted duty structure in textiles as basic textiles are charged at 
18%, while the later parts in the value chain attract lower rates. See, you see this that the basic textiles, which are the raw material, are attracting 18% of tax, while the later parts of the value chain, they attract lower rates, and that is not feasible. Okay, next, moving on. What is a GST council? Now, GST council is a constitutional bodies. Okay, please always make a note of the various constitutional bodies uh, within India. Some of the other constitutional bodies are EC, uh, UPSC, okay, the Comptroller and Auditor General, okay, and then the Finance Commission. So the bodies which have been defined by the constitution itself are known as constitutional bodies, whereas statutory bodies are those which are created by the statute of the government. So some of the examples of statutory bodies are, say, um, the Central Vigilance Commission, say, the NHRC. These are examples of statutory bodies and so on and so forth. There are several statutory bodies the Food Safety Standards Authority of India. Okay, moving on. Now, now uh, more about the uh, GST Council. What it does it is that it makes recommendations to the union and the state government on issues relating to, relating to goods and services tax and was introduced in the constitution. 101st Amendment Act. This was the Amendment Act which introduced GST and the GST Council's role is to see if the GST that is relied on products is it sufficient, it has to be changed and then what are the products which should be under zero GST. You know, it decides everything related to GST. Now, this particular GST Council body is chaired by the Union Finance Minister and the other members are Union State, Minister, Union State Minister of Revenue, who is at the center itself, and ministers in charge of finance or taxation of all the various states of India. Okay. Now, it is considered as a federal body. Why? Because both the center and the states get representation. Now, the center has around uh, one third of the total vote weightage. While the states put together, they have weights of two-thirds of the total votes. However, in order to pass any decision at the GST Council, we need three-fourths of the weighted votes. Hence, the center has a veto. Okay, moving on. Now, please do read what the production-linked incentive scheme is also. Uh, we recently had production linked incentive schemes in various sectors such as electronics, such as automotives. Now this production linked incentive scheme, it actually gives producers certain incentives for increased production. Say for example, you have manufacturers of electronics. Now they have invested more capital to produce more electronics the next year. The government gives a benefit of 6% of the, uh, I'm just giving this as an example. The government gives a benefit of around 6% of the total sales done uh, on, the incre on the incremental production. What I mean to say is on the increased production as compared to the previous year. If it was producing 150 cell phones, say from the next year, it starts producing 150 cell phones. So on this 50 additional cell phones, it gets 6% of the money back. Okay. Now, moving on. Next topic. Dengue outbreak. Okay. The dengue breeding checkers who are deployed to normally check mosquito breeding have been working without a permanent post at the civic bodies in Delhi for the last 26 years. Hence, they have started a strike in Delhi to regularize their employment. 
so you see most of these workers who are working in the municipal bodies hardly have formal jobs now why don't they have formal jobs the reason why they don't have formal jobs is because when you get formal jobs then it is necessary to give you minimum wage it is also necessary to give you insurance provident fund you know a lot of other benefits it is uh, necessary to follow all the uh, labor code acts such as uh, industrial disputes act uh, such as uh, bonus pay payment of bonus act so in order to avoid this usually most of these corporations municipal bodies they go for informal jobs now this is resented by the workers because they want all these benefits these are legally their right they should be getting them okay okay now what is dengue now dengue is a mosquito borne tropical disease it is caused by mosquitoes now what type of mosquitoes cause dengue it is caused by several mosquitoes of the genus aedes please remember this because upsc has this habit of asking about viruses and diseases and the pathogens and uh, the carriers etc okay now even last before year they asked a question related to uh, i believe anopheles mosquito not last before year but was it was in 2017 okay now dengue is caused by the aedes aegypti mosquito now the diagnosis of dengue infection can be done only with a blood test even after doing a blood test most of the times it is not clear as to what the uh, disease is and there exists no one single medicine to treat dengue and that is the reason why it is so dangerous it also causes a lot of death india registered over 1 lakh dengue cases in 2018 and over 1.5 lakh cases in 2019 according to the national vector disease bond uh, national vector bond disease control program now this national vector bond disease control program it is the central nodal agency for the prevention and control of six vector bond diseases what are the various vector bond diseases malaria dengue lymphatic filariasis kala azar japanese encephalitis chikungunya out of these only malaria dengue uh, japanese encephalitis and chikungunya are caused by mosquitoes what causes lymphatic filariasis and what causes kala azar please do read them what are their vectors uh, okay this uh, national vector bond disease control program works under the ministry of health and family welfare directly okay now recently there has been a change in the way we are trying to control dengue earlier there was a treatment it was more of a curative nature it was curative in nature now we are shifting to preventive healthcare now uh, recently researchers from the world mosquito program have used mosquitoes infected with the wolbachia bacteria to successfully control dengue in indonesia in singapore okay etc now what does this wolbachia bacteria do uh, this wolbachia bacteria is prevented from spread, spreading dengue okay through future bites because this particular wolbachia bacteria itself outcompetes the malarial virus or the uh, malarial plasmodium for resources such as lipids and fats hence because this wolbachia bacteria outcompetes the virus the virus cannot survive inside the host body okay and hence it is not i am sorry uh, host body and hence the virus cannot be spread to 
other people like humans okay now how is the wolbachia bacteria spread the scientists they infect certain uh, mosquitoes with wolbachia bacteria especially male mosquitoes and they release them into the city where they breed with the local mosquitoes until all mosquitoes in the area are ca carrying this wolbachia bacteria now what is this called it is called population replacement strategy why because you are replacing an entire population with wolbachia infected mosquitoes okay now please remember these keywords population replacement strategy use it in your mains or use it in the prelims if they ask you next crz norms violation the brihan mumbai municipal corporation authority served an inspection notice to the union minister for msme for violation of the crz norms this news is not very important however what is important is the crz norms okay what are the coastal regulatory zone norms okay the coastal regulatory zone norms they restrict certain kinds of activities such as large constructions setting up of new industries storage or disposal of hazardous material mining reclamation and bunding within a certain distance from the coastline of of rivers of uh, seas okay now now the ministry of environment forests and climate change under the environment protection act uh, issued the coastal regulatory zone notification on the recommendations of the shailesh nayak committee please remember all these keywords the crz norms are issued under epa act of 1986 under this we have the coastal regulatory zone notification now most recently this coastal regulatory zone uh, no notification has come out till 2018 uh, different now these rules were last released in 2018 different rules are released periodically and they are updated so coastal regulatory zone uh, rules were released last in 2018 as per these new 2018 rules rules coastal land up to 500 meters from high tide lane and a stage of 100 meters along the banks of creeks estuaries backwater and rivers subject to tidal tidal fluctuations is called the coastal regulation zone so this is what is under the coastal regulator a uh, coastal regulatory zone norms coastal land up to 500 meters from high tide lane okay along all these things this is what falls under crz norms now these crzs are however they are categorized into four different zones now all crzs don't have the same regulations crz under crz 1 norms uh, those lands are called as ecologically sensitive areas these areas lie between the low and the high tide lines only here no construction is allowed except activities for atomic power plants defense activities etc okay no other construction is allowed in this most ecologically sensitive areas so you have under the crz norms you have areas that fall within 500 meters even within these crzs there are different different types of crzs and they are there are different norms for each of these crzs CRZ one is ecologically sensitive areas, and over here no construction is allowed between the low tide line and the high tide line. CRZ two areas are known as the shoreline areas. This includes the urban areas that are built up. Okay, construction act construction activities are allowed on the landward side only. Okay, it is allowed only towards the landward side and not towards the seaward side. Okay, next CRZ three. These are undisturbed areas. Okay, these include mainly rural areas, like how the shoreline areas under CRZ two norms are urban areas. Under the CRZ three norms, these are mostly rural areas, and no new construction of buildings is allowed in this zone except of repairing of the existing ones. in the notification new categories for densely populated rural areas have been included for crz 3 areas 
okay within this crz3 areas there is no new construction of buildings except repairing of the old uh, buildings itself and in the new 2018 norms there is a classification further of these rural crz areas into crz 3a and crz 3b now now crz 3a areas are densely populated rural areas with a population density of 2161 per square kilometer such areas will have a no development zone of 50 meters from the high tide line as against the earlier 200 meters okay however why why do they have a no development zone of 50 meters because the government wants to increase the built up area okay so it has reduced the uh, restricted area for building from 200 meters to 50 meters okay but this is only for those areas which have a population density of 2161 people per square kilometer and then you have crz 3b areas which are rural areas with a population density below 2161 such areas shall continue to have a no development zone of 200 meters from the high tide line okay these have 200 meters and these have 50 meters only now what are crz 4 areas these are territorial areas okay now under these crz 4 areas we have area covered between the low tide line and the 12 nautical miles seaward it is not on the coast but rather it is towards the sea it is the area between low tide line and 12 nautical miles seaward fishing and allied activities are permitted in the zone okay over here no untreated sewage effluence pollution from oil drilling shall be let off or dumped okay over here only fishing and allied activities are uh, permitted and all these activities are not permitted no construction can be used for dumping sewage effluence and all of these okay now you need to remember that those areas which are coming under crz1 areas and crz4 areas shall have a clearance approval from ministry of environment at the center while those areas which need approval under crz2 and crz3 norms have been delegated to the state levels for approval hence the states can give approval for crz2 and 3 now CRZ rules are actually made by the Union Environment Ministry however the implementation is to be ensured by the state governments through their coastal zone management authorities please remember these uh, CRZ rules because uh, they have been time and again in the news the supreme court had recently ordered demolition of uh, huge buildings off the coast of kerala okay and noida earlier etc okay now moving on ban on single use plastics the odisha government has asked all the producers and stockers of single use plastics to exhaust their stocks by june 30th itself as manufacture import stocking distribution sale and use of identified single use plastics would be prohibited from july 1st okay now the plastic waste management rules plastic waste management rules of 2021 had actually uh, prohibited the usage of certain particular identified single use plastics from july 1 and hence the state government is asking all the producers and stockers of single use plastics to exhaust their stocks okay now okay it was done under the plastic waste management amendment rules 2021 under the section 5 of the environmental protection act now do you remember seeing the section 5 of the environmental protection act earlier okay see so oh, here we have the environmental protection act and under the same act we also have plastic waste management rules which are issued now what are some of the plastic waste management rules 
these particular rules of 2021 are prohibiting the manufacture import stocking distribution sale and use of single use plastics including polystyrene and expanded polystyrene from july 1st this covers so all these are banned from july 1st 2022 and not just the usage it also bans the manufacturing import stocking distribution sale and use okay not just use all of them what and all are getting banned earbuds with plastic sticks plastic sticks for balloons plastic flags candy sticks polystyrene thermocol for decoration plates cups glasses cutlery wrapping or packaging fi- films and around uh, sweet boxes invitation cards cigarette packs uh, plastic or pvc banners which are less than 100 microns stirrers all of these are single use plastics which are getting banned now the ban will not apply to commodities made up of compostable plastic this particular ban on single use plastics does not apply to compostable plastics also the permitted thickness of the plastic bags will be increased to 75 microns from 30th september onwards 2021 and from 120 microns from the 31st december 2022 hence for now we have 75 microns only that can be used the central pollution control board along with the state pollution boards will monitor the ban okay now what are single use plastics you need to know that these are plastics which cannot be used more than once like what we had discussed earlier cutlery you know plastic bags uh, straws all these which are usually used once and then disposed of are known as single use plastics they are primarily made from fossil fuels fossil fuels like crude oil now during crude oil distillation you also have polymers which come out which are used in the making of plastics so plastics have several problems not just uh, does it involve the, the usage of fossil fuels but plastics are also very slow to disintegrate okay and uh, hence we are trying to reduce the dependence on plastics fundamental duties enforcement the supreme court on monday asked the union and the state governments to respond to a petition to enforce the fundamental duties of citizens what are fundamental duties okay in a democracy it is believed according to laski and to gandhi that rights are follow without duties why because if everyone takes their rights and doesn't perform their duties then how will the other person enjoy his rights hence rights and duties have to go hand in hand they are equal the swaran singh committee only recommended the inclusion of a separate chapter on fundamental duties in the constitution the original constitution did not have a separate chapter on fundamental duties okay they were added to the through the 42nd amendment act okay now what are fundamental duties what are the characteristics of fundamental duties fundamental duties some of them are moral duties while the others are civic duties for example uh, ch- if you can go through your part 4a of the indian constitution when you go through the part 4a of the indian constitution there exist different duties okay some of them are civic duties while the others are moral duties i can give some examples of uh, moral duties now cherishing the noble ideas of freedom struggle is a moral precept however uh, respecting the national flag respecting the constitution respecting the national anthem this is a civic duty this is considered as a civic duty because these are protected through prevention of insults to national honor act and you can be prosecuted for these things these can be enforced okay 
while this cherishing the noble ideals of the freedom struggle is innate you have to follow it inherently okay now there are some more i can read some more for you um for example uh um mm, to defend the country and render national service when called upon to do so would be a civic act it is under 51a d sub clause this would be to render uh national service when called upon to do, do so however 51a e this says that everyone needs to promote harmony and spirit of common brotherhood amongst all the people of india transcending religious linguistic lines this is again a moral duty so when they ask you to categorize them you need to be able to categorize them next now the fundamental duty is refer to the values which have been a part of the indian tradition mythology religions in other words they essentially are a codification of tasks which are integral to the indian way of life however unlike the fundamental rights which extend to all persons whether citizens or foreigners the fundamental duties are confined to citizens only only the citizens need to follow the fundamental duties people who are foreigners and aliens they don't need to follow fundamental duties also uh uh like fundamental uh, unlike fundamental rights fundamental duties cannot be enforceable also unless and until the government has enforced it by itself like the directive principles of the state policy the fundamental duties are also non justiciable you can't go to a court saying that the government has not uh enforced my fundamental duties the constitution does not provide for the direct enforcement by the courts moreover there is not legal sanction against their violation even if you violate it there is no legal sanction until the parliament has made a legislation regarding it if the parliament uh, has made a legislation like the prevention of insults to the national honor act then you can be prosecuted for not abiding or not uh, following your fundamental duties uh, it is to be noted over here that the swaran singh committee which recommended the fundamental duties also held that the government has to make paying of taxes a fundamental duty and it suggested punishment punishments for people who are not paying taxes however the government did not implement this now there are also criticisms of the fundamental duties why because the duties that are given are not exhaustive it does not cover other important duties like paying taxes like casting votes family planning and so on some of the duties are very vague for example different interpretations can be given to phrases like noble ideals of the freedom struggle com- protecting the composite culture of india ensuring that you are promoting scientific temper in the society you know you can have a very wide interpretation of these words it is not very focused they have been uh, described by critics as a code of moral precepts due to their non justiciable character they can't be enforced directly you know they have to be enforced only after the legislation by the government and hence it's a problem now also fundamental duties are under part 4a of the constitution they don't have a separate part to themselves they are an appendage to part 4 which is the dpsp okay next russia to recognize rebel ukraine regions as independent so this is a topic which we have been discussing for a while now because russian troops have been mobilized and there are about 130000 russians who are on the border between ukraine ukraine and russia russia is to the right of ukraine it has a very long border with ukraine and these are the factions of ukraine which have separatist russian elements they have russian separatists this region is also known as donbas out of this we have two principalities one is luhansk and the other one is donetsk
Now Russia has been supporting insurgency over here and separation over here. While well, Ukraine has been trying to keep these regions as a part of it. Uh, I am sure you remember when we discussed this crisis earlier, we spoke about the 2014 Russian annexation of Crimea, which is present in the Sea of Azov. Now, Ukraine has been witnessing skirmishes. It has been seeing infighting between the rebels who are the separatist elements and the Ukrainian forces from 2014 onwards since the Ukraine, uh, the Crimea crisis happened. Now, this has resulted in a loss of over 14,000 lives and it has created around 1.5 million internally displaced persons. Now, regarding Russia and Ukraine, in 2014, there were Minsk agreements. One was in 2014 and the other was in 2015. These Minsk agreements were to establish peace between Russia and Ukraine. Now, see, to understand the entire Russian-Ukrainian crisis, please refer to older videos. We've done the entire uh, crisis in depth. Uh, the problem is that uh, Russia has been trying to uh, encourage separatist elements in this particular region. You see Luhansk is over here and Donetsk is over here. Luhansk and Donetsk. Now, this entire coast it has is with Russia. And Russia has been and a lot of people over here are Russian speakers. And hence, Russia has been encouraging these particular people to separate out of Ukraine. Now, this entire task, uh, this entire push uh, by Russia is because uh, there are fears in Russia that Ukraine might become a part of NATO. And hence, Russia wants certain assurances that NATO will not continue to expand eastward. It wants a written agreement saying that NATO will not expand eastward to occupy Ukraine. Because if NATO expands eastwards, then NATO will end up placing missiles in Ukraine. And this will be a security threat to Russia. And hence, Russia does not want this to happen. Earlier in 1992, when the USSR disintegrated, the then uh, president had promised, George Bush Sr., he had promised that there won't be any expansion of NATO towards the east. However, all the countries such as Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, so many countries, they had actually joined NATO. And hence, Russia does not want to compromise on its security anymore. It wants to push back. Russia also has other demands that any security related decision regarding Eastern Europe has to be taken after consultation with Russia according to it. However, the Western countries believe that these countries have the right to independent foreign policy and they need not listen to what Russia is dictating them. Now, what is this Minsk agreement? These Minsk agreements were signed in order to ensure peace between uh, Russia and Ukraine. Now, the first Minsk agreement was written in September 2014 by the Trilateral Contact Group on Ukraine. What, uh, who are the members of this trilateral uh, contact group? Ukraine, Russia itself and the organization OSCE. The OSCE is nothing but it uh, is established in order to prevent uh, violence in Europe. It is known as the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. It was uh, founded through the Helsinki Accords. Okay. Now, uh, this uh, trilateral contact group, it works through mediation by France and Germany. Under Minsk 1, Ukraine and the Russian-backed rebels agreed to a 12-point ceasefire. Ceasefire. Which, due to violations by both the sides, did not last long. It fell flat. And hence, in February 2015, we had a Minsk 2 agreement, where representatives of Russia, Ukraine, 
and the Organization uh, for Security and Cooperation in Europe and the leaders of Donetsk and Luhansk signed a 13-point agreement. This is known as the Minsk II Accord. However, there are problems with the implementation of this accord as well because Russia and Ukraine have different ideas, interpretations of this agreement. While Russia believes that the agreement asks Ukraine to grant Russian-backed rebels in Donbas autonomy first and representation in the central government, only after this is done, Russia will hand over the control of this Russia-Ukraine border to Ukraine. However, Ukraine believes that this has to happen first and then only this will happen according to the treaty. Ukraine, on the other hand, feels that Minsk to allows us to first establish control over Donbass, then give it control uh, of the Russia-Ukraine border and then have elections in Donbass and a limited uh, devolution of power to the rebels afterwards. Okay, And hence, because of this varying interpretation, there are issues. Next, moving on. Blockchain technology. Okay, this is the most important technology currently. Why? Because of these NFT tokens online. Because of how many uses blockchain uh, technology has. It can be used in uh, property documents. It can be used in voting. It can be used in uh, secure messaging, uh, etc. Okay, now we'll understand what blockchain is. According to the finance secretary, the center has no intent to bar the use of blockchain technologies for functions other than those related to payments. So the center is keen on regulating only the blockchain related to payment, but not usage of blockchain technology in other endeavors. Now, what is blockchain technology? Blockchain technology, blockchain itself is nothing but it is a data structure. It is a type of data structure. Now, blockchain is a digital ledger and a ledger is nothing but a book containing accounts. So, blockchain is nothing but a digital book which contains different accounts, say. Okay. Now, it is nothing but a digitized, decentralized public ledger. It has accounts, different, different transactions, which are noted into this particular ledger. Now, how does it work? Blockchain is made up of separate individual blocks. Okay. Now, this particular block is connected to the previous block and this particular block is connected to this block. Okay. A block is the current part of the blockchain which records some or all of the recent transaction and once completed it goes into the blockchain as a permanent database hence once this particular part once this block goes into the transaction it becomes a permanent part you cannot roll it back you cannot rewrite it you will only have to join another block to it in order to make changes to it you can't rewrite the already existing block okay and each time a block gets completed, a new block is generated. After the finishing of this block, this block is generated. After the finishing of this one, this is generated. And blocks are linked to each other like a chain in a proper linear chronological order with every block containing hash of the previous blocks. This contains a hash of this block. And that is the reason why it goes and attaches to this previous block. Okay. Now, Every time a block gets created, the way it gets attached to the previous block is when all the users, around 50% of the total number of users of this particular blockchain, approve it. Okay, this approval is usually done through mathematical transactions. Hence, because so many people need to approve it, it is very secure. And after it is approved, it goes and joins into this previous block. Remember, it has a uh, this particular new block that it's created. It has a hash of the previous block. And hence, it knows 
to go and attach to the previous block. Now, this blockchain technology allows transactions to be anonymous and secure. It is peer-to-peer -peer because you and I can also approve the transactions and make it happen. And it is instant, very fast. It doesn't have to be waited for manual updation or for a later time. It can be approved then and there. Now, what are the advantages of this blockchain technology? It creates trust. Why? Because so many people need to approve it. In, for one block to get added to the ledger system. Uh, it is fraud proof. Again, it ensures transactions are conducted in a decentralized manner because it's not any central entity. There are so many people who have to approve for a block to get added to the ledger. Blockchain's nature also cu cuts costs for organizations. Why? Because there needs to be no, no centralization. It can be maintained in a decentralized manner by common people and hence it cuts the organizations it in, it increases security by involving so many people it cannot be hacked because the only way you can make changes to a, a blockchain is by adding a new block to it you cannot rewrite the already existing blocks these are existing block you can't rewrite them you can only make changes to the new block which is going in okay now blockchain creates an unalterable record of transactions with end-to-end -end encryption which shuts out fraud and unauthorized activity increasing security blockchain can handle transactions significantly faster than conventional methods it also increases accountability and transparency blockchain enables an unprecedented amount of individual control over one's own digital data because it is decentralized and it is not with any centralized authority like the government or any private organizations, it ensures that there is right to privacy. Okay, next, the uses of blockchain. Blockchain can facilitate innovations across a range of processes wherever there is security threat and wherever there, the trust is very low. It includes financial transactions as we can see through bitcoins and cryptocurrencies electoral voting medical records which need more secrecy academic lessons property ownership records like land records and so many others okay this can increase the security it can reduce the costs it can increase accountability transparency okay 